The citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondria. Pyruvate, assuming that there is enough oxygen present, pyruvate will move into the mitochondria. It's shuttled into the mitochondria. It will move from the cytosol through the outer mitochondrial layer or membrane through the inner membrane into the matrix, which is what you see right here. This is my matrix. Okay. Contained within the matrix are enzymes necessary for the citric acid cycle, as well as for what we're going to refer to as a preparatory step. You'll hear this, this preparation step has a number of different ways to describe it or to use it. Some people might call it a preparation step. Some people simply include it in the citric acid cycle. Some call it an intermediate step. Whatever you choose to use is fine with me. The important thing to understand is this must happen before we can actually get the citric acid cycle going. So what we're looking at here is a chemical reaction. And you can see that we have one pyruvate or pyruvic acid, whichever you prefer to call it. And that pyruvate in the matrix of the mitochondria is going to encounter an enzyme. Now I don't have my enzyme listed. I haven't named it here and that's fine because you don't need to know it. But an enzyme is going to take my pyruvic acid or my pyruvate and it's going to combine it with something called a coenzyme. And specifically it's a coenzyme A. Now coenzymes and cofactors, if you think back to the molecular interactions lecture. We talked about coenzymes and cofactors as both being molecules that bind to enzymes to help those enzymes catalyze their chemical reaction. Okay, And just like an enzyme, they're not consumed. They're going to be reused, recycled, used repeatedly. And we'll see that process, how that happens. Coenzymes tend to be organic molecules. They're quite often vitamins. Whereas cofactors tend to be inorganic molecules such as magnesium or calcium um, or, or so forth. In this case, we've got a coenzyme and it's coenzyme A and it actually comes from vitamin A that we consume. And so that's where it's coming from. That's how we get it. What it, it is is, is a, a product of this vitamin A consumption. So pyruvic acid combines with my coenzyme A in a chemical reaction. And in that process, pyruvic acid is going to be converted into, it's going to combine. So it's going to bind to this coenzyme molecule right here. And so you can actually see what we're going to do is we're going to essentially break this chemical bond right here and bring that S into that chemical bond right there. And so the S becomes bound to my carbon. You don't need to know all the details. I'm just kind of illustrating it so you can see it, so you can get used to seeing chemical structures. That S combines with my carbon, and now we get a brand new molecule. And now I want you to look at this and count some carbons with me. One, two. Let's go back over here. One, two, three. Um, that should be setting off bells in your head if something in your head should be saying, whoa, that's not right. Matter cannot be created and destroyed. Where did my carbon go? Did I destroy it? Of course not. Where it went is that during this process, that carbon, when we cut this off, we actually get my carbon dioxide, which looks like this. That's my carbon dioxide. And look at that. Carbon, oxygen, oxygen. So when I break that bond, we end up forming a double bond between the oxygen, and suddenly I have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is considered a byproduct or a waste product. Okay. It's not used as an energy source. It is used as a buffer. It is going to be part of the buffering system in our blood. But the vast majority of carbon dioxide will be expelled by the respiratory system. 
So we still have three carbons, but one of them is going to disappear because we're going to exhale it. I think exhale only has one L, but we're going to go with it anyway. And in this process here, let's look at this. We've got an oxidation reduction reaction. And not surprisingly, as we often do in oxidation reduction reactions, we have our good friend NAD. And that should have, this particular textbook always forgets the plus. I don't know why. That should have a plus there. So it should be NAD plus producing NADH and that tag along hydrogen that we should be used to seeing. And so if the NAD is my oxidized form, my NADH is my reduced form, and that would mean that my pyruvate in this case is my reduced form, and my acetylcholate is my oxidized state or form. Glucose metabolism is often called glucose oxidation because we are, with each progressive step, oxidizing the sugars. Each and every step, or let me rephrase that, virtually every step oxidizes the sugars. And so with each step, that sugar is losing an electron, um, or electrons, plural. Okay. Now, remember that we started this whole game with 2 pyruvate which means we're going to actually have to combine it with two coenzyme A's to make two of my product acetyl-CoA. Now in terms of remembering names, remember I told you I want you to remember glucose, I want you to remember gluco gluco glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, you need to remember pyruvate, let's add to my list, you need to know the name of this, acetyl-CoA or acetyl-coenzyme A. I'm okay with either term you choose to memorize, they both mean the same thing, acetyl-CoA and acetyl-coenzyme A. Um, CoA is for short. And so you'll want to make sure you know those, that term and can recognize it and talk about it in, uh, on the exam. Now, where does this NADH go? Well, like all NADHs, its ultimate goal, hopefully, assuming that it actually makes it there, and most of them do, is to go to the electron transport chain. So remember that.